If, if you've never installed a fuel cell, the task can be a little bit daunting because if you don't install it correctly, it could put the driver of the vehicle in a really bad danger situation in the event of a collision. In this video, I'm gonna cover all the things that you should think about when you're putting a fuel cell in a car, at least all the things I think about. Uh, more specifically, a radium 10 gallon fuel cell. Uh, this video can be used as a guide for any vehicle, but more specifically, you know, if you wanted to copy paste, this is an A86 drift car. So when you're deciding fuel cell placement, there are a few things to keep in mind. Uh, now this isn't in any particular order, but you need to think about future proofing for potential mods later down the road, weight reduction, ride height and road debris, collision protection, firewalling for the main uh, cabin, as well as potential trunk usage. Some organizations also have specific uh, fuel cell mounting requirements. So obviously that's probably the big thing you need to consider. Now, when you're looking inside of the car, trying to figure out where you're going to put it um, really depends on all those things I mentioned earlier. So talking about like weight distribution and potential planning for future mods, you'll see some people, they'll put their fuel cell like up here between the strut towers instead of back here, like in the trunk. And part of that is for weight distribution and, and also planning around future mods, but it's also a safety thing, right? If you got it further forward, there's less potential for a collision from the back, you know, destroying it, taking on the fuel cell, causing a fire or explosion. But also weight distribution comes into play because if you've got it further forward, that's more weight over the rear axle instead of having it, it's more centralized in the vehicle instead of having it after the suspension, then it's more rear placement weight. For me, my car's a little front heavy because I've got a heavy engine or heavier than stock engine and a big old supercharger hanging off it. So putting mine further back really isn't necessarily an issue for me. When you start mounting the fuel cell in, in the trunk here, and dropping it down, well then you gotta think about uh, clearance with the road uh, or the track. You also gotta think about debris, potential debris damage. And you gotta plan around some of that stuff. Typically what I try and do um, is I try and mount it about halfway, uh, halfway up the diff, right? So that way that, that gives me plenty of ground clearance. There's other things that are gonna hit first. If you have a independent rear suspension car, you could probably mount about three quarters of the way down the diff instead of ha at the halfway point. But for a live axle like me, the entire rear axle moves around. So it's better to have it placed uh, a little bit higher because the whole axle jumps up and down and then the fuel cell could be the point of contact with the road or with debris instead of the rear axle. Like this. I have it lined up with the pan hard bar right as it comes across the diff. It's below the pan hard and above the sway bar. So that looks pretty good to me. When you're thinking about like the clearance for your exhaust, usually I try and keep it about, mm, about an inch of clearance between the fuel cell and the exhaust at a minimum. Having about an inch of clearance between the fuel cell and the exhaust, that provides enough room for the exhaust to move around because exhaust isn't usually rigid mounted. It also provides enough clearance for uh, heat. So that way your fuel cell doesn't get super bad heat soaked. If you're going any closer, you should definitely have some sort of heat protection for the fuel cell, a heat shield of some sort. Even at one inch, it's a good idea. You also need to think about the clearance from the back of the car, because a lot of times in drifting, you know, you're throwing sick backies into a wall or something, and it might actually push the back of the car into the fuel cell. So trying to position probably as far forward as you can, if you're gonna mount it in the trunk floor like me, is probably the best thing you can do. That way you've got more uh, room for impact or, or crush You've got more of a crumple zone before it hits the fuel tank. I took a look at an A86, and this is about four inches further forward than the stock fuel tank in A86. So I feel like this is pretty okay. This white thing you see all the way up here, well, that's my, my firewall. So that way the fuel system is completely separate from the, from the passenger cabin of the vehicle. And that's a tech requirement for Formula Drift and for most drift organizations, whether grassroots or professional. If you're putting a fuel cell in your car or a surge tank of something like that inside of the trunk, it needs to be fired, firewalled off from the cabin. And that prevents, you know, flames and fumes from getting into the passenger compartment, which is potentially hazardous and, and, and dangerous. 
Now, the last thing to think about is trunk usage. I'm taking this car on drift week, so I'm hoping that I can mount the fuel cell low enough to where I can put a cover, cover over the top of it and that way I can have a you know firewall over top and just have an access panel to fill up with fuel as well as to you know check wiring and things like that. But also what that means is I can use the trunk to put stuff in it. Once you have these basic kind of things figured out, then you can go ahead and put your fuel cell in the car and decide how it's gonna go. Obviously I cut out the trunk of my car because I plan on putting the fuel cell there. That is not required. Uh, there's a great video actually of Modi Bakshis where he only cut out part of the trunk of his car so he could set the fuel cell down in it and then use the body structure to weld his fuel cell cage to that. Now the material that I'm working for as far as the structure is gonna be one inch square tube. On a lot of drift cars, you build like a whole rear cage for the fuel cell. That way it's nice and structurally sound in case of a crazy accident. But this car, like I'm not, I don't drive this car super hard. I drive it hard enough to have fun, but I'm not super aggressive. I'm not driving in Formula Drift, so I don't feel the need to have this big crazy structure around it uh, because I don't want to cut up the whole back of the car. I like leaving the factory frame rails in there. So what I've done here is I've got a, a piece of the one inch square tube held up by a jack and I've marked on the frame where the fuel cell lines up on this side. Then what I did to make sure it was even from both sides is I measured from this, the subframe back. It's about seven inches. On the other side, I measured the same distance, seven inches back and marked it. Now I'm gonna use the frame rail to trace my outline a bit here of the angle that I need this to sit at because my frame rails the angle in here at the front, they're not straight. So since they angle in, I'm gonna need to cut these at an angle. Now for the back, I marked where it goes across here because I set the bar in here as the fuel cell was sitting here to figure out where it went exactly. And it's straight back here. So luckily, I just need to measure from frame rail to frame rail to see what the total length is. Looks like 38 and a half. Maybe a little less now. We'll start with 38 and a half. You can always take metal off, but you can't exactly put it back on. So I figure I'll shoot for longer on both of these cuts. And then once it's cut, I can fit it in there, see how it all, you know, all, how it all sits in there together. And if I need to, I can just shave a little bit more off if I need more off. And here we have everything fitted. I had to hammer just a little bit to get these to fit right, but it's just such a perfect snug fit. All right, we have everything pretty much fitted at this point. I had to use the hammer to get these into position, but they fit just perfect. I've got all the gaps lined up here, 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 here. I know everything fits good now. I need to take it all back apart and clean the metal, get it ready for welding. All right, so we've got everything pretty well set up in here. We're gonna pull the fuel cell out and then we're gonna weld the crossbars to the frame rails and then we'll weld the fuel cell cage to the crossbars. I just want to say this, I love welding, but I also hate welding because look at the stupid space I'm in trying to weld this crap. So we've got everything kind of in here now. Um, I started tacking it together already because I forgot to press the record button. Uh, but what we're going to do is we're not necessarily going to seam weld the entire thing. I'm going to do things in like one inch stitches and I've just been skipping from corner to corner to corner and keep going around and around and around. Um, and then eventually we'll get, we'll get it finished up. All right. We have the mounting cage welded in. Now it's time to drop the fuel cell in. Ta-da! Right, now we have the fuel cell mounted. I painted a little bit in there to be able to seal out corrosion. So I, I did a little bit of prep work and then painted the framing so that way my car doesn't rust apart. Now we're gonna talk about the fuel lines and then we're gonna get into the fuel pump wiring. The Radium FCST comes with AN fittings for the pump in and the pump out, as, as well as the vent port. So what's important to think about here is your application as far as the fuel line sizes you choose. My car only makes 250 horsepower. So 
it doesn't make a whole lot of power, so I don't need ginormous feed and return lines. I'm running dash six AN lines. I knew I needed to get an adapter for my feed, my pump feed out. Now, not every car is gonna use these stainless steel braided AN lines. It's a pretty standard for performance applications to have these kind of lines or types of fittings. However, that doesn't mean that you need to go out and buy AN lines for the entire car. What a lot of people will do is they'll run the factory hard lines with an adapter fitting that goes from their, from their hard line to an AN fitting, and then they'll create just a short AN line to go from the hard line to the fuel cell. This is totally normal and, and very acceptable. You don't need to run all new fuel lines. But if you are going to run fuel lines, say you've got a higher power application and the stock lines are just not going to, be able to keep up, you want to consider the size of the line for the amount of fuel that you're flowing. Generally, they look at like a power rating, but more it's more about making sure that the fuel line is an adequate size for the volume that's flowing to and from the engine. Fuel lines are, are pretty simple as far as that goes. You'll just need to make sure to get the appropriate fittings or adapters and create a line to make it work for your car. To make an AN line, you really don't need a whole lot of fancy tools, right? You get your fittings, you get some wrenches, uh, you get a cutoff tool, and then you learn how to put the fittings on the lines. So that's the hardest part. Tape is your friend, I will tell you that much. Tape and a cutoff wheel. All right, let's get into the wiring now. The wiring that you have for your fuel pumps on your fuel cell is gonna be dependent on the fuel pumps that you have installed, as well as the load that they're going to see. If you make a pump output higher pressure, it's going to need more amps to do so. Whereas if you output a lower pressure, it'll need less amps. So think about that and take a look at the fuel pump manufacturer's recommendations for the wiring size. I'm running dual Walbro 255s, both the lift pump and the feed pump. So I went with 12 gauge wiring, which is kind of overkill for a Walbro. However, I made sure that I've got enough headroom that if I decide to change things later, I can. In most cases, it's better to have too thick of a wire than too thin. And then you set up your circuit protection for fuses and relays according to the load of the wiring or of the component. Now what I've done here is I've set up a dedicated fuse and relay box just for the fuel pumps. It's gonna go straight from the battery terminal to the fuse and relay box to the fuel pumps. And then for the grounding, it's gonna go from the fuel pumps directly back to the battery. This just makes sure you don't get any kind of additional electrical load or problems with the fuel pump wiring, you know you're gonna have solid wiring. This is typically how I wire fuel pumps direct to the source. The relays are controlled by the ECU, so I've got one wire that goes out and up to the ECU and that grounds the relays and allows power to transfer. Radium sends their fuel cells with a wiring kit for the FCST. When you get it loaded to the fuel cell, FCST and everything. So this is pretty straightforward and simple. I'm just gonna need to measure the wires going from the, re the fuse and relay box to the fuel pump, cut them, add the terminals on here and bolt them down. When I go to run wiring for really about anything, I measure out how long the wiring needs to be and then I give a couple extra inches after that. That way, you know, in case something happens, it's not gonna get pulled tight, it's not gonna pull anything out of the terminals and it's not gonna start stretching the wires out or anything, you know, bad like that. Here you can see I've already cut the wires. I had it a little long at first, I trimmed that down. You can see both my power and my grounds. Now I'm gonna strip the wiring back just a little bit, crimp on my terminals and then bolt them down. You just want to strip back just enough so that the ring terminal can slip over it here. And here, you can see it's going to fit on just perfectly like that. Before crimping it, you want to slip on your heat shrink, which Radium sends with the FCST. We're going to slip that on back a little bit. We're going to slip this guy on. And you don't need necessarily a fancy crimp tool for this, but you do. you should have at least some crimp tool. This is what I use for stuff like this. It's got two different settings, essentially insulated or non-insulated. This is non-insulated, so I'm gonna go ahead and stick the terminal right in here, squeeze it down nice and tight, and then I always double check to make sure it's not gonna pull out. Great, that's done. Now I can get this set up with the heat shrink and then uh, shrink it on down. The heat shrink helps make sure the wire isn't gonna pull out of the terminal, as well as insulates it from moisture and other kinds of damage. Radium sends you with two types of hardware for the fuel pumps. You've just got regular nuts, and then you've got these black anodized aluminum ones. These regular nuts are also a lock nut, so you can see on one side they've got these three dimples, and the other side they're flat. So you put it with three dimples up, so as you tighten it down, that locks it in place. The next bit of wiring is gonna be for the fuel level sender. Now this uses 
The fuel level center uses a Deutsch style connector. It's a two pin and they send you with the other side of the connector. The resistance value for their fuel level center might not match your car. So there are adapters that'll convert the signal. However, mine's close enough and I'm just gonna wire it in. I've got this other connector here and my factory fuel level gauge is this wiring right here. I already looked it up. I know it's the yellow and red and the black and white. So I'm gonna go ahead and snip the wiring at the back of this connector here and then I'm gonna crimp on the new connector right back here. So we're just gonna go ahead and snip the yellow and red, snip the black with white. This is what the pins look like for this connector. There are fancy crimp tools that you can buy. This is just what I use. This is a cheap one I got on Amazon. Since I don't do this day in day out to make money, I do this for me. I bought just a cheap one and it works all right. There's a couple different die settings in here. So depending on the terminal size, you'll need one of these different ones. Another good thing to do if you're working on an old car like me is to inspect the wiring when you do this. I don't see any green crusty stuff, so that's a good sign. The wire looks nice and clean, so I don't have to worry about running new wires. Sometimes what I'll do is I'll get the pin settled into the tool first and then slip the wire in. Boom, done. Okay, we got both of these wires done. I'm gonna leave this other one dangling for now. We've got these guys in here. Now we're gonna put them in the connector and plug them in, it's that simple. The beauty of this connector style is that it's very easy to disassemble. It's got a little lock that you can really usually grab with a pick to pull it out. So if you do pin it something backwards, you can easily pull it apart, swap the pins and put it back together. Very easily serviceable. Push it till it kind of clicks into place and you can see it comes all the way forward. And then you're just gonna go ahead and push it down, locked into place. Connect it up. Boom, there's your fuel level sender. The last part to install for your fuel cell is gonna be your fuel vapor vent setup, all right? That's what this is here. It's a pretty simple part. All it does, it consists of a hose, a fitting to connect the hose to the fuel cell, a fitting on the other end, which allows you to put a little breather filter on it. So that's all that it is. What this does is this vents you the fuel vapor and the fuel fumes outside of the car. That's the most important thing. You wanna make sure that when you plumb this, it goes outside of the car. The other most important bit is that you have something like this, okay? Fuel tends to slosh out the fuel vapor vent, even if it has the rollover check valve, even if it has the one-way check valve, whatever it is, it tends to slosh through the fuel vapor line. So what you do is you put a couple loops in it just like this. When that does, that prevents the fuel from spilling out. This kind of works as a baffle to be able to prevent the fuel from going out. Typically what I do when I'm running a fuel vapor vent is I like to run it like straight up. That way it's not, it's gonna have a harder time sloshing out and then I'll do the little twirl. Different people have different mindsets for that. That's just typically what I, what I like to do. Some people put the little twirly bit right there on the fuel cell. Some people use a hard line. Now some people will do the twirly bit mounted sideways, which I do not recommend. It should be vertical because that's the, the gravity is what prevents the fuel from sloshing out. You do it like this and eventually the fuel is gonna, the G-force is gonna slosh around and fuel is gonna come out. You do it like this and it's gonna help trap it a little bit better and keep it where it's at and not allow it to flow out because of the gravity. Now I have a panel that's gonna enclose most of this in and a box that goes over top of this to protect the fuel lines, the wiring and other components. What I need to do is I need to route this outside of the car. I could dump it out the floor, but what I've decided I want to do is I'm gonna route it this way to the side. I know that right over there where the fuel ga gas cap normally would be, that's a great place to vent that I've got a little path that I can go to over there. So I'm gonna go ahead and run it from here over there, put my little twirly bit over in the side panel and then dump outside. The fitting down here is great. It's super easy. It's just a push lock. So you push the line on, you're good to go. I also like kind of doing it this way because it tucks the hosing a little bit out of the way. So that way there's still some room in the trunk for some stuff. And there we have it routed right here to where the fuel filler normally is. And there you go. That's putting a radium fuel cell in any car, but more specifically, this is going into an A86 drift car. The concepts I explained here can apply to any vehicle, whether it's a drift car, a full-blown race car, whatever have it, everything that you learn from this video, you can adapt to whichever vehicle you are building and whichever sanctioning body you are driving with. 
If you've got any questions, put them in the comments below. If you're curious about the products I installed here, I've got links to everything in the description. Thanks for watching.